without uh, further ado, I want to go and introduce the first speaker for today. Our keynote speaker, the third keynote speaker, is Loro Keller from the University of Lausanne, and uh, we are really happy that you agreed to come and you managed to make it. And when you uh, think about Loro, you can have, uh, you can think about several things. One of them <laughs> is the view that he can see from his office. At least those people that visited Loro knows that he has probably the best view that a scientist can ask. And it's bringing several questions. One of them is how can he keep his students and postdocs working in the lab when there are so many opportunities outside? So in my case, I work with Gene Robinson in the Midwest, so it's not a question. <laughs> there, is a, there is nothing to do outside. You sit and you work. But in Lausanne, it's a, it's a challenge, actually. So, and actually, probably, it's bringing a lot of a good atmosphere and a, a lot of uh, great ideas because Loro was is, is definitely one of the heroes of our field, came with a lot of great theoretical contributions and a lot of discoveries. And today I will not be able to uh, mention all of them because I will take all his time. So I will just remind you of some of the highlights. For example, the discovery of the social chromosome in ants, uh, clonal reproduction in both females and males in ants, genetic acid termination, evolution of, su uh, of super colonies, using ants to test evolution theories of aging, which is a very productive uh, line of research, and the green beard in the red uh, fire ants, and many more. And in, in addition, Loro developed some of the technologies and tools that are important, specifically for the research in ants, but, and, but for advancing the field. Recently, they developed a tracking system that can track really tiny ants and can track the entire colony and follow all the social interactions. Before that, he, he has a very productive line of research in which he models social behavior in robots, and then he can ask several questions about the evolution of social behavior, which if you cannot do in, uh, in our time scale with, with live animals. And of course, he was uh, the driving force, and I think uh, also fundraising for the Solonopsis uh, Invicta uh, genome. So, for not taking more of your time, please accept uh, Laurent. Welcome. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. I, I, I just made a small error. I took a uh, sleeping pill at 4.30, so I hope I don't fall asleep. And after I took f five coffees, so I, I hope I don't need to leave to, <laughs> to do something else. How is it to move the slide down? Okay. So we had two uh, beautiful keynote lectures uh, yesterday and the uh, day before yesterday. And as you all know, bees and termites are an inter intermediate level of social complexity. And it's my pleasure today to talk about an organism which is at a slightly higher level of uh, social complexity, so the ants. And ants can be extremely variable, so you have a lot of uh, mode of reproduction. And so do you, have, you can study many things, many type of conflicts within colonies. And I try to put a US flag, but it's really difficult with the little uh, stars, yes. <laughs> if you will really unite, maybe we could uh, do one uh, flag with, uh, with uh, the ants. And today I'd like to talk um, on the difference between queens and workers. And as you know, this is an extreme case of phenotypic plasticity. You can have very different individuals with different shapes, different morphologies. And of course, you have in a colony some individuals, the queens, which lay eggs, but they don't do much. All the work is done by the workers, just like in humans. And so this leads to several uh, incredible adaptations, and one of them is the lifespan of the queens. Queens can live to 20 or almost 30 years in uh, social insects, which is amazing for an insect, which typically live uh, only a few weeks or a few months, usually. And the question is, how, how an individual becomes a queen or, or worker? So what are the factors which make a larvae develop in one of the two type of individuals? And until recently, it was thought that it was only the social environment, the type of food or pheromones, which will make a larvae developing into a queen or into a worker. 
and males uh, in Hymenoptera uh, are haploid. So it used to be thought that it was purely uh, environmental factors. And with time, there have been several exceptions coming up. The first one, one of the first was in Pogonomirmex, where genetic data showed differences uh, between different types of individuals. And we did several studies to understand how it works. And we found that within the population, you have two genetic lineages. Queens are of, are of a pure lineage, and they mate with two types of males, males of the same lineage, and males from another lineage, and all offspring which are fathered by males of the same lineage develop into queens, and all offspring which are fathered by males of the other lineage are workers. So in a population, you have uh, queens of lineage one, lineage one, they produce males of the same lineage, or they will be lineage two, lineage two, they produce upright males of the same lineage, but they both have to mate with the two type of males to be able to produce the workers and, and the queens. And actually, it's interesting, those lineages uh, evolved by hybridization, ancestral hybridization, between two uh, other species of Pogonomirmex. Now there is no more gene flow neither between the parental species, nor between uh, those lineages. A few years later, we found another unusual case of reproduction in Cataglyphis, where queens produce new queens uh, by parthenogenesis. Most new queens are produced by parthenogenesis and they keep sexual reproduction to produce workers. So by so doing, they have both the benefits of sex and asexual reproduction. They transmit all their genes to the reproductive individuals, but they keep sex to maintain genetic diversity within the colony, which is beneficial for uh, several things. And more recently, we found another case, uh, which is even more extreme in Wasmania. In that species, queens produce all queens by clonal reproduction and they produce all workers by uh, sexual reproduction. And because workers are completely sterile, it will mean that, it mean, it will mean that the males will have a zero reproductive success because they will only contribute to the production of workers which are sterile. But in that species, males also reproduce clonally, and this occurs by the sperm entering the egg and removing the maternal genome or fertilizing an egg which has, been, uh, no, which has no maternal gene, and then you get a new male which is a clone from its father. And so these are three extreme cases which have been found recently. The similar system or slightly divergent system have been found in uh, several other species. I'm sure there will be many more cases which will be found in the future because people had already some data showing those type of reproduction before we found them but they never published it because they couldn't make sense of things. But now people will have strange data, look more carefully and find many more cases. But I think those hardwired system of caste determination are still extreme. And in many more cases, you have more subtle interaction between uh, genes and the environment. And one example is, is, uh, is in Pognomermex rugosis. So queen mate with multiple males, and some males are more likely to produce queens and workers, and some males are more likely to father the workers than queens. And this has <coughs> been taken as evidence of or cheating patri lines or royalty lines, but there's an alternative explanation. This could be interaction between the parental genome. And to test that, Tanya uh, managed, Schrander managed to do a mating between queens and workers, which is difficult with many end species, this one included. Hopla. And so she managed to do uh, mating between several uh, colonies. And so she took female from colonies, mated with male from other colonies, and females from this did a sort of reversed uh, experiments. And what she found that when you mate, for example, female of these colonies with male of this colony, uh, you produce almost only workers. But if you will take the same uh, females mated with male of another colony, so you produce mostly queens. So if I, met, if I will uh, mate with you, I think we will produce mostly workers. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe with Dr. Gadow, <laughs> that will lead to many queens, baby. <laughs> and so here, the important point, and when we did an analysis, there was no paternal effect on caste determination and no maternal effect. So it's really interaction between my genes and yours, and my genes and yours, and not only your genes or my genes, which influence whether queen, uh, a larvae will develop into a queen or a worker. And I think if you take 
Cast determination, we will find everything between purely environmental, maybe the honeybee is the best case so far, and purely genetic. But people have been too quick to say that it's purely environmental. And so an interesting question is how genetic effect interact with the social environment to affect the phenotype and behavior of individuals and colonies. And I'd like to present some work, it's old work, it's a, it's a last century work with which we did with Ken Ross, and so more recent work uh, which was uh, led mainly by John Wang. And so it's in the foreign Solenopsis invicta, which is a species which has been introduced in the US. Some people think it could be a way to control American people, but I'm not sure. Uh, but at least it's quite painful, and, uh, and when you have them in your garden, it's not very good. And they have been introduced also since them in Australia and in China. And you have two social forms, a form with a single queen, which is large, which departs on independent colony founding, and there's strong aggression uh, between colonies. And in the polychinous form, you can have many queens, up to 100. They tend to be smaller, I will show some data. After mating flight, instead of starting their new colony, they return to an established colony where they will start uh, to reproduce. And new colonies are formed by birding, that is the queens and the workers leave the nest on food to start a new colony nearby. And we did um, several studies with Ken uh, using allozymes to look for gene flow. And we found something strange at one locus, uh, which is called GP9. And uh, GP9 means general protein, so it means we don't know what it is, but I will come later to that. And at this locus, you have two alleles, a big B and a small B allele. And it's a monochinous colony, so colonies with single queen. All individuals are almost good for the big B allele. The queens, and young non-reproductive queens and the workers, we genotype many individuals and they're all almost good for the big B allele. In polychinous colonies, things are, more co are, are different. You can find a small B allele, but you have strange uh, genotypic distribution with strong deviation from hardy Weinberg distribution. And you have more heterozygote than what you will expect for all types of individuals. You have an almost lack of homozygote for the small B allele. And also you have a lack of big B, big B individuals, especially for queens. So we did several type of experiment. And it turned out that uh, the small B allele behaves like a recessive lethal allele, so that females which are homozygote for this allele die soon after they close from the pupae. And uh, then uh, this raises the question of what's hap happening here. And as you can see, most of the difference is for queens. Um, so what we decided is to look for phenotypic differences between queens. And we found that big B, big B queens are indeed heavier and more fecund than the queens of the two other genotypes. You can find a few small B, small B queens when they are young, but they will die uh, later on. So we thought that maybe those phenotypic differences may affect the probability of queens to be accepted in colonies, because as I mentioned, in polychinous colonies, queens return to an established colony. So we took 20 queens from each of 19 colonies, and we introduced them in the mother colony, and recorded the, the behavior of the workers. And what we found that some queens will be readily accepted by the workers, but some of them will be attacked by the workers, like this one. And then it takes a few minutes until you have three pieces, and we here we'll do some high quality morphology. So he, one piece is the head, the other one is the thorax, and the other one is the abdomen. So the workers cut the queens in three pieces, and most of them die. <laughs> and we found that then we genotype the queens, and we found that they attack only big B, big B queens. They never attack the queens of the two other genotypes. And we repeated, it, repeated this experiment with all the queens and found the same pattern. But there's also an age effect so that uh, the older big B, big B queens are, the more likely they are to be attacked and killed by the workers. We have an explanation for those data uh, now. So those queens are lacking because they are killed by workers. Actually, probably when they are young, you know, young reproductive queens, about also 40% of them, but even in the colony, when they start to develop their ovaries, they start to be killed by the workers. And by the time they are fully reproductive mature, all of them are killed by the workers. So we have a, here a case of extreme overdominance with only heterozygote individuals which can survive. So now this is strange because if uh, you remember, the big, 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 big queens which are killed by workers are also their heavier queens. 
So you have to conclude that uh, workers don't understand evolutionary biology because why would they kill what looks to be the best phenotype, the heavier and most fecund queen? So when we first published those data, we didn't know uh, what was in explanation. But later on, we saw that maybe it could be due to uh, the effect of a selfish gene, uh, which will be defined as a gene which does something which is good for its own propagation, but bad for the individuals in which it is. So in that case, either a small B allele or another gene uh, linked to the small B allele could induce workers which do carry one copy of that allele to kill all the queens which do not carry one copy of that allele, that is a big B, big B queen. So to test that, we reintroduced queens in the mother colony and collected the workers which were attacking them and compared the genotypic uh, uh, frequency of workers with workers collected around a heterozygote queen. And we found that there were indeed mostly or only heterozygote uh, workers which were killing the big B, big B queen. So that supports the idea that there's indeed a selfish gene which induces the workers to, to kill uh, the queens which do not carry one copy of the small B allele. And when I did those experiments, I noticed that sometimes when I was taking a big B, big B queen with a forceps, the workers were attacking the forceps, suggesting that there's something on the surface of the cuticle that workers use to recognize queens of the two genotype. So we did a very simple experiment to test that. We took some workers, rubbed them on big B, big B queens, or heterozygote queens, introduced them in the mother colony, and recorded the behavior of workers. And we found there was a strong difference depending on whether the workers had been rubbed on a big B, big B queen, or heterozygote queen. When they were rubbed on a big B, big B queen, there was high level of aggression, those from zero to three, and about 40% of the workers were even killed by the nest mate. By contrast, when they were rubbed on heterozygote queens, uh, the aggression was low, and they will not be killed uh, by the nest mate. So this really shows that there's a difference in order which is responsible. And a few years after we did those experiments, the gene GP9 has been cloned and sequenced by Michael Krieger, and he found that it's an order-binding uh, protein, which in insect can carry uh, orders and pheromone into hemolymph. And interestingly, between the big B and small B alleles are nine mutations, and only one, uh, non, uh, one synonymous mutation, suggesting that there's been strong directional selection uh, acting on that gene. So to summarize, <coughs> in um, monogynous colonies, you have one genotype. They produce a large queens, which depart on a mating flight and start a new colony on their own. And when you have only big B, big B workers, they will never accept more than one queen and so a monogyne colony remains monogynous. In polygynous colonies, they can produce three types of queens which have different phenotypes. Those phenotypic differences affect what the queens can do. So big B, big B queens are about the same size as the queens produced in the monogynous colony. We think that they can start new colony on their own, but it's very difficult to follow because they fly uh, really high in the air. But what we know is that they cannot re return to an established polygynous colony because they will be killed by the heterozygote workers. So heterozygote queens are smaller. They don't have fat, enough fat reserve to start a new colony on their own. They produce only a few workers, not enough to survive. But they can readily be accepted in a polygynous uh, colony. And those ones, they have only one option in life. And so in colonies, in, when you have heterozygote workers, they will accept several queens, but only heterozygote queens. So this shows that a single genetic element, and I will get back to what is this uh, genetic element, influence the behavior of workers. It is responsible for the presence of the two social form. And that's interesting because that was the first genetic element to, to be shown to influence social organization. And interestingly, GP9 is also completely linked with social organization in the three most closely related species which can have monogynous and uh, polygynous colonies. So this is a direct effect of uh, genetic, but there's also an effect of social environment. And here's a slide. So what is the effect of social environment? Who is sensitive to social environment? If you want to enjoy the sun, you have to give an answer. <laughs> There's one type of individuals here who change one genotype who does different things depending on social environment. 
of young, promising men. Or less young, but established men. Uh, for the queens, the, the workers, these, these are the big queens. Yeah, the big, 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 big queens. The big, 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 big workers. So when you have only big, 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 big workers, they will never accept any queens. But here you have a lot of big, 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 big workers, and, and they will attack those queens. So it means the big, 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 big workers change behavior depending on what type of colonies they are. So the question is, what does induce a change in behavior of those workers? And we thought it's a ratio of workers. When they're only alone, they will behave in a given way. And when you uh, add some heterozygote workers, they will change behavior and start to accept heterozygote queens. So to do that, we change the ratio uh, of workers in colonies. So we started with monochinous colonies, we moved the monochine queen, and we get them, we introduce the polychine queens and the heterozygote queens. So the workers will start to attack the queens, but what you can do is you take the colony, you put it in the fridge, as you know, and it's go to sleep, and you get uh, them out from the fridge, they will start to attack. But if you did do that about 10 or 20 times, they will get used to the new queen, and in the same way you can get the monochine queen in a polychinous colony. So they get used to the new queen, and then you can change, uh, follow the ratio of workers, how it changes over time. And we did that for 20 colonies of each type. And in all but one cases, uh, we found that there was a shift of behavior of the big, 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 big workers when there were five to 10 percent heterozygote workers. And when there were five to 10 percent heterozygote workers, they would start to accept heterozygote queens and even accept several of them. And this is quite strange because it means it's a minority. So here you have mostly uh, American people. You will add a few Swiss people inside and everybody will change the behavior. And it's only five to 10 percent. So this is quite uh, unusual. And I will come back to that later. So it shows that the behavior depends of in, of workers depend on their own genotype, but also the genotype of other workers in the colony. And so the question, how can the behavior change depending on the social environment? So to do that, we develop a microarray, or to, to, to be more precise, uh, John Wang uh, developed a microarray with uh, some of other students. We try to have as many genes as possible, and we wanted to do uh, two experiments, compare gene expression of the two genotypes in polychinous colonies, and also compare gene expression of big B, big B individuals, which are either in monochine uh, or polychine colonies. So I will start uh, to show uh, those data. So we did the uh, uh, data for 20 colonies with group of seven to 10 workers per colony. And so in polychine colonies, so here are the 20 colonies, here are the genes. We found 39 genes are differently expressed, of which uh, for certain we could find known function. And eight of them were quite interesting. Uh, first, there were six genes which are implied in chemical signaling in green. And so this is quite interesting because we know that order difference is a mechanism used by workers to discriminate between queens. And there were two transposons. And transposons are also interesting for the following reason. In many ways, we could see that this, the genomic region which makes you becoming monochinous or polychinous should have the same properties as sex chromosome. So if you think of a Y chromosome, it's only males. It includes a gene which makes you a male. And over time, it tends to accumulate genes which are good for the male function. And to, to keep those genes together, you decrease recombination. And when you decrease recombination, then you start to accumulate deleterious uh, elements and transposable elements. And here, you could think of same. So the small b haplotype, I will call it the small b uh, chromosome from now on. So the small b haplotype is on the part of a chromosome. It makes a colony to become a polygynous. Um, it, so it includes one or several genes which make individuals behaving like a polygynous colony. Um, by similarity, we could think it should accumulate other genes which make a good uh, polygynous colonies, like the mode of dispersal, size of queens, or other things. And once you reduce recombination, uh, you, then you have to keep those genes together, and a good way to do it is to reduce recombination by an inversion, for example. And so when you have that, uh, you predict that there should be accumulation of deleterious alleles and transposable elements. So to test that, I had students who said, now we have to do the genome of the pharynx, this one, this one, and this one especially. Uh, now this was the two, and Oksana helped, I, I, she, she's here. 
So, but I was not so keen on genome because it's a type of uh, big commitment and boring enterprise. But they were pushy enough to do it, and Dwayne helped us also to, to do that. And so we did this genome. And of course, when you do a genome, you have a lot of contexts, and after the premise to put them together. So John Wang suggested to use rat sequencing, uh, and he did it just before he left for Taiwan. And so he develops more than 6,000 markers in the genome. And then we did put them together, and we obtained 16 linkage groups which was really good news because 16 is exactly the number of chromosomes of the parent. So here you have the 16 chromosome. And the inter interesting one is uh, 16 because here is where you have uh, GP9. And there was something really interesting for this uh, uh, chromosome. Uh, we had about 400 markers in the chromosome, but for 285 of those markers, there was no recombination. So this is a huge part of the chromosome, 60% of the chromosome without any recombination. And uh, this uh, part of the chromosome is about 12 uh, megabases. So the question is what prevented recombination? So we thought it could be maybe uh, an inversion. So John and the student tried to show that. And uh, ANS has a very tiny chromosome, so it's very difficult to do in situ hybridization. But at the end, he was successful to find some markers and he showed that there was at least one inversion. It could be bigger, but the minimum size of the inversion is that. And this is probably the mechanism or one of the main mechanisms which prevent uh, recombination in that region. So basically, here we accumulated one more piece of evidence for this social chromosome. That is, there is one chromosome uh, which does not recombine between the big B and the small B haplotype. And I'd like to show you a few more data. First, we did also in several experiments, we compare gene expression of uh, uh, heterozygote individuals, big B, big B individuals, and uh, big B, small B individuals. I show you already microarray. But here is a summary. And here are the genes which are differently expressed in different experiments for workers, queens, and males. And here is the location of the genes. These are each of them is a chromosome. And as you can see, there are some genes which are differently expressed between um, a genotype, which are on other chromosome. But most of them are on chromosome 16, and most of them are in the non-recombining region. And so it means most, most of the genes which are differently expressed are in this special part uh, of the genome. And we also try to look for um, evidence of accumulation of repetitive elements and uh, look for the evolution of the genomic region. And the work was uh, done by Yannick Grum, who is here also. And so we found little differentiation between the big B and uh, small B haplotype. <coughs> Both of them have uh, the same no uh, number of genes, the same genes. And we dated the difference, differentiation between the two cr uh, chromosomes at about uh, 400,000 years. And this is probably one reason why it's not really uh, very much different. Uh, but there is a lot of difference in terms of uh, repetitive elements. <coughs> the small <coughs> the small B haplotype has many more repetitive elements, many more transposons. And we found also a small uh, transpose se sequence, uh, which is in a uh, desaturase, which that could be interesting because it could uh, affect the order on the small uh, B haplotype. So there could be several minor differences which could affect the order between uh, genotypes, but this we don't know exactly what is yet uh, responsible. So basically, we found that really this chromosome, this social chromosome, has many of the properties uh, of, the, of a Y chromosome because of the lack of recombination, and we predict that it should degenerate uh, over time. Now I'd like to move to the final uh, co uh, comparison, the comparison between big B, big B individuals in the two social forms. Uh, we found 91 genes which are uh, differently expressed. And, in, and for 18 of them, we could uh, find a uh, match function in a data set. In, and interestingly, all, for all those genes, the function makes sense. First, out of the 18 genes, there were 11 metabolic genes, which were more highly expressed uh, in the polygiant colonies and in the monogiant colonies. And this makes sense because we know that there are size differences between workers in parents. And on average, the workers in polygynous colonies are much smaller than the workers in the monogynous colonies. 
and it has been shown uh, previously that smaller workers have a higher metabolism and larger workers. So it makes sense to find higher metabolism in workers in polygynous compared to monogynous colonies. And the remaining seven genes were also interesting because they were all associated with, pa uh, with pathogens. And there was evidence of more viruses and defense in polygynous colonies. And this makes sense also for the following reason. The monogynous colony, as I mentioned, the queen after mating flight, she departs on the mating flight and she's tried to start a new colony on her own. And in a room like that, there may be several hundred queens which will come in summer. And then when they produce the first workers, the first thing the workers will do is that they start to raid other colonies. So my workers will start to raid uh, Jürgen's colony. And Jürgen's colony, they do the same actually. <laughs> and so if Jürgen is a bit more workers than me, it goes a bit fast in that direction. And at some point there's no more brood in my colony. And what happens in France is that my workers will leave me and they go to Jürgen, so I will die. But the same occurs between all colonies. So in, in a room like that, there will be only a few colonies which will survive. And these are really the colonies which were most productive at the beginning. So if a queen is parasitized, it has no chance to survive because she will produce fewer workers and then she will die. So there's very strong selection against parasites in the monogynous form. <coughs> By contrast, in a polygynous form, the colony returns to an established colony. And even if a queen has a parasite or if she produces fewer eggs, <coughs> <coughs> she will be in an established colony, so it's more like a socialistic type of uh, country. So the weaker can survive. And so here, if a queen will have a parasite or virus which uh, decreases fecundity, she can still survive, and that can lead to higher uh, parasitic load in, in those colonies. So to conclude, um, we found that GP9 is in a large 13 megabases region which does not recombine. There are about 600 genes in that um, region. And the interesting question for which I have no answer is, how did this region evolve? And what are the genes implicated? So these are difficult questions because, um, because the genes implicated, because they're linked together, we cannot uh, disentangle them. And this is a problem with super genes to know exactly what genes does what, because uh, they behave like a single uh, linkage group. But interestingly, we can use the fact that the three most closely related species <coughs> also have this type of genetic basis for social organization. And we just genotype last week, I have a question for Dwayne Shoemaker. <laughs> That's a project with Ken Ross and, uh, and Dwayne. And we genotype quite a few males of uh, um, Synopsis uh, Richteri. And what's your prediction? Do we have a large non-recombining region or a small one, Dr. Shoemaker? Large one, so one point, congratulations. <laughs> so in the most closely, um, closely related species, it's exactly the same region which found, which does not recombine between the big B and the small B haplotype. And now we need to collect more individuals from South America to look in the other, uh, other uh, species. Um, we found that there are 39 genes which are differently expressed uh, depending on the GP9 genotype in, in workers. And most of those genes are in the non-recombining uh, region. So it will be interesting to see what are the regulati uh, regulatory mechanisms which lead to differential expression uh, between uh, haplotypes. Um, we also found that there's another set of genes whose level of expression does not depend directly on the genotype of, of the individual, but it depends on the genotype of other individuals. So when you have more than 10% Swiss people, let, no, let's say more than 10% Israeli people, it means that it affects all our gene expression, in that case 91 genes, which are differently expressed. And here I can see one guy smiling. Hopla. Ah, here he is. This guy is smiling because here this is a case of what he would call indirect genetic effect. That is, the behavior of an individual does not only depend on his own genotype, but it depends on the genotype of other individuals uh, in the group. And finally, um, finally, this shows that the phenotype of the colony uh, depends on important interaction uh, between direct effect due to the genotype of individuals and also indirect effect which are due to the genotype of uh, other individuals. 
and those one interact to make the phenotype of, uh, of a colony. And I think this is an interesting theme which will come up in many cases because many social, many organisms have social interaction and the effect of those social in interaction are important. And as I mentioned, for example, even for cast determination, there are also pleiotropic effects, so it's not only a gene which is important, but the gene effect will depend on other gene in the genome and other gene in the genome of other individuals in the colony. And I think this is going to be an interesting field of research for people working uh, uh, on, so, uh, on social insects because we are in a very good situation to study that. And I'm sure this is going to be quite important in many cases because there are many such cases. If you think, for example, of Drosophila, um, some males have a higher reproductive success than others, but it depends with the, queen uh, the female they mated with. So it's not only the male genes which are important, but it's the interaction between the male genes and the female genes. So my genes would be good with this female and not very good with this female. And this occur in Drosophila, this occur in ants, and this is likely to occur in all type of organisms. And I think we are really in a good position to investigate such things in uh, social insects. And finally, so this, super, this uh, social chromosome is a, is a case of a, a super gene. And the super gene is a group of genes which are linked together. And I think those cases are much more common than what people think. So we, with Tanya, we reviewed the literature, and here are just a few examples which have been well studied. Uh, in butterflies, in birds, in, in fish, you have many cases where you have a group of genes which are linked together. And this is selected on when you have a situation, for example, you have two types of flower. Uh, I have a gene which is good to, to digest this flower, but another individual has a, a gene which is good to digest another flower. Now you have a gene of preference which is nearby. So if they are nearby, if you have a gene of preference for this flower and I'm good to digest them, they will be selected to, to become linked together. And this occurs frequently by inversion. And the same will be true for the other flower, and the one which is good to digest this flower, they will be selected to, to be together. So as soon as you have interaction between genes, you can have selection uh, to keep them together. And what's really important is behavior. So what makes it favorable is when you are good for one environment, and then you have genes which make you selecting this environment. And in all those cases, more or less, you have behavioral differences which are associated with some phenotype, which are good with the uh, good mix between two phenotypes and two types of behavior. And there are probably hundreds of cases. These are well-documented cases, but when you look in the literature, you have hundreds of cases where you have two types of individuals in a, in a, in a population, and they differ in many traits. So it could be one gene affecting uh, maybe a transcription factor, affecting several genes, but it's much more likely to have a group of genes which have become linked together. And my prediction that in the next 20 years, we'll find many such cases. And the weak support for that is that we found the first case in an ant, but a few months after, there's been already another case which has been found by Michel Chaprissa in Lausanne, and it's on a formica species. It's completely a uh, different type of species. The genes which are involved are on different chromosomes, are completely different genes, but there's also a genetic basis for a monogenous and a polygenous type of, of, of queens. And if you think of ants, there are many species which have monogenous and polygenous colonies, in many cases, you have several tra traits which differ, like uh, the size of the queen, the more dis dispersal, the behavior of workers. And it could be a type of cultural transmission, what I thought in the beginning. But it's much more likely now, I think, that you have a super gene which make you of monogenous and polygenous type, type. And I wouldn't be surprised that we found that maybe 20 or 30 or 50 percent of the polymorphism we find in ants are due to uh, super genes. And that will be my prediction that. Uh, in a meeting in uh, 10 years here, that's what people uh, will find. And on that, I'd like to stop for questions. Okay, we do have time for questions. Laurent, do you think it's possible when we get more genome sequences and maybe at the individual level to look for the incipient stage of a super gene? Do you think there'll be some signatures there, or is it just some single event that just happens? 
I, can, I guess that could be everything. So I hope that in other closer related species, we have smaller, uh, not only, not still 600 genes, but uh, we have cases with fewer genes because it could be breaking up or maybe, so on sex chromosome, usually how it starts, it's a set of genes which do not combine. And over time, there are several strata, so there are new genes which are recruited, which become linked to that. So the non-recombining regions typically <coughs> have increased on, uh, on sex, determina uh, sex determination gene. And for example, for, for us uh, in, in humans, so the Y chromosome, it, there's only a small part of the chromosome which can recombine, but it has increased over time. And I guess we can find everything and I hope that by looking by two closely related species, and this uh, program we, uh, pro project we have uh, with Ken and Dwayne, uh, we'd like to see now in other species, we hope to find how it evolved. And also the evolution is interesting because it could, be, it could have evolved uh, one time before speciation, and the two haplotypes may have been maintained after speciation, but it could also have evolved by hybridization. And actually, many of those super genes, which I mentioned, like in butterflies, you can find in several species also different phenotypes. And the uh, haplotypes are more sim similar across species than they are uh, within species. And in one case, at least, it has been shown it, it evolved by hybridization. And that could be also my prediction by, uh, for science. There's probably a few cases, and you need one case of hybridization, and then your ele element, which be can be strongly selected, can spread in the population. But I think like in a honeybee, we had this uh, African honeybee, I'm sure we're 60% sure it's a super gene. And I think we'll find many such cases when you have polymorphism. And there are many polymorphism at least in, uh, in ants within species polymorphism. Question here? Yeah. Laura? Uh, uh, is, there, uh, is there any specific feature that would uh, predispose ants to, uh, uh, to have a high rate of inversions? Uh, I don't think so. Well, we know little. I think that's, I don't know if there are other inversions which are known in social insects, but, um, but with the genomic, now with the rat sequencing, we can do that. Uh, but I don't think there's anything, I can think of nothing special in ants for an inversion. So probably the more recombination, the more likely you, you have to, you are to, to get some uh, inversion, but I think all social insects are pretty good for probably, as far as we know, for yeah. high recombination rate. And so, and so you think perhaps that that might speed up the accumulation of, of super genes in, in that, just by No, I, I think super genes will be important. I think people, we look in the literature and I could come up, we found about 100 cases where it is weak indirect support for, uh, for super gene. And I think of those 100, I, I, my guess is that 60 or 70 will be true cases of super gene. Because the phenotypes, there are several phenotypes which are linked and it's really hard to find how a transcription factor could affect such different genes. And the phenotypes are really adapted. It's not like uh, they do something and they're just smaller. They do something and they're good to do it and something else. There are three different things which are linked. So it means there's been selection on that. And the only way to get that, or the best way to do that, is to, to have those genes together. So has anyone looked at the, uh, the cuticular hydrocarbon profiles of the workers and queens from the two genotypes? Yes. Uh, we did, a well, many years ago, I, we did a, a study with a chemist, a British chemist, and he said that there's one substance which is different. So I did spend my summer to paint my hands <laughs> with no success. But we have done with Jürgen Gadow, no, Jürgen Liebig, we have um, he analyzed and we know several substances which are different between workers and between queens of the two, two, uh, uh, the two social forms. And we identified also several genes in chemical signaling which are differently expressed, but we don't know yet which, which is really the order which is different, <coughs> which makes workers selecting between the two type of queens. Like, but not completely different. Overall. Yeah, but I think it's something that small, uh, the small B haplotype must be producing something which make workers recognizing queens <coughs> of, of that genotype and allows them to reproduce uh, when they have this order. And then they will kill it when they don't have this order. Laura, thanks for a great talk. I'm just wondering, um, I just, you, you got me thinking about the role of ecology 
and maybe driving the system. I'm just thinking about the differences between dependent and independent colony foundation. I mean, do you see, based on some of the theory, you know, that a dependent colony foundation, the colonies take a bunch of workers, they bud, and so there's probably a much higher rate, I guess, of uh, inbreeding, I guess. And so that that might have driven, you think, the differences, uh, you think, or how do you, so how do you see e it? Ecology is important because it, what's, what makes uh, some population having many monochine or polychine colonies, so the monochine is really good to colonize new habitats. So when they've been introduced in the US, this you had only or mostly monochine because they, they could fly 10 kilometers and they really move quickly. The polychine, they cannot go so far away because they have to walk. But once they are uh, somewhere, they are really good to monopolize the place. So if there are like monochine here and polychine, if this monochine colony dies, the polychine, after one day, they will start to colonize the place so they can extend. It's a bit like a cancer. So it's really how much new habitat are formed and how much stable it is, which makes you more section for monochinous or polychinous. Now in the polychinous colony, there is no inbreeding. So some people have talked about unicolonial species inbreeding, but this is wrong. These are huge populations, so they made randomly in the population, so there's no inbreeding uh, in, in the polychinous co uh, population. So there's only been a bottleneck when farms have been introduced, so that's why you have more different males. But this is a one-time event, but now there's no more inbreeding. And that's true for all uh, unicolonial species. There's no, no real inbreeding because when they mate in the nest, they only do it when they form large population with thousands of individuals. Laurent, I want to come back to the polygynous, monogynous um, differences in disease pressure or pathogen and virus pressures. That's, I could follow that certainly for um, vertical transmission. Um, your argument that there's higher disease pressure in the polygynous colonies. But when you think about horizontal um, transmission, does that also apply? Uh, this is more difficult to say. Maybe horizontal, they could be a bit more transfer because so in the modern Chinese colony, you need a worker from that colony to get a disease to transmit it. In the polychine, maybe they move between nests, so there's maybe a bit more transfer between colonies, but that would be much less difference. So it would be especially for, for things which are transmitted vertically. Here we don't know those viruses. They could be transmitted vertically, so I, it makes sense, but I don't ever prove that this is a reason. But it could be that those viruses are transmitted from one generation to the next one, but we don't know exactly what they are and, and so. Uh, do, for, for supergenes, do you think that it's usually the case that there's low side together, that there's re, uh, recombination being suppressed, or do you think it's usually that low side are being imported into an already existing region? I guess in the early stage, it's the genes need to be close together. So they could be re, even no inversion, just being close together, very close. Uh, that could be good because maybe the rate of recombination is low, so that's one process. Now, everything which decreases recombination is good. So inversion is one mechanism, but it's not the only one. You have also epigenetic factors which can decrease, uh, greatly decrease also uh, recombination. For example, between men and women, so the places where the hotspot for recombination are not the same for men and women. So it means that there are epigenetic, uh, and that's on autosomes. So it means there are epigenetic factors which can greatly affect the rate of recombination. And in Drosophila, you can select, there's been one experiment where they selected for rate of recombination, and there was a huge, it, you can really select strongly rate of recombination. So you need to start by genes which are nearby, and then an inversion or selection for decreased recombination makes them together. And then by chance, it can go much further away than what's needed, but then it's all this region which can be selected the same way. And then they can recruit genes which are good. For, for example, sex chromosome recruit genes which are good for the male function or the female function. So it's a non-random movement of genes across the genome. And there have been many studies in birds and mammals to show that, that sex chromosome attack, attract one type of genes, autosome another type of genes. But in France, it's either too new uh, to do that or, or maybe the selective force is uh, lower, so we don't know yet but there's no evidence of genes moving across, uh, across chromosome yet. Hello, here. <laughs> um, just to put a little salt in, <laughs> in, the, in the discussion, I think speciation literature, right, is it, we have looked for a long time when you have a signal and then you have to have the kind of 
physical linkage between the signaler and the receiver, and, and most came up empty-handed, right? We have a couple of cases, so I, I, I think we will find more cases of these uh, super genes, I'm sure, but it's still a minority. And I mean, the other comment I had or question is, why chromosome evolution also drives that the chromosome gets smaller? Basically, those Y chromosomes lose everything which has nothing to do with, with sex determination, right? The, and eventually, the Y chromosome vanished too. I mean, that's, so do you see any signs if you compare with the other species that the chromosome on which you have your super gene becomes overall smaller? So first, so super gene, I, I guess, I'm sure it's going to be important for uh, intraspecific polymorphism. For speciation, it, ca it, could, it can be one factor, but that's not going to be the main factor. Now, about degeneration, there are several factors which affect the degeneration of a chromosome. So when you have no recombination, it will degenerate uh, because recombination is good to, to remove the bad, bad element. But there is one thing which is important in Hymenoptera. It is that males are haploid, and so you have expression at the haploid level. And this is a very strong force to remove the de deleterious elements. So sex chromosome, the Y chromosome can degenerate quickly because it's with the X chromosome. So if you have a recessive mutation on the Y, it's not strongly selected against because it's with the X chromosome. But here we have the haploid male, and haploid males can survive. And with a small B male, they can survive. And any gene which is bad for the small B, which is expressed in males, will be counter-selected. And interestingly, in plants, so you have also expression at the upright level in plants in the gametophyte, and sex chromosome of plants degenerate much more slowly than the sex chromosomes of uh, animals. And so when you have expression, and in animals, you have almost no expression at the upright stage. And so expression at, at the upright stage is a very strong force to prevent degeneration. I'll, I'll follow that up quickly. Uh, is the super gene expressed the supergene genes, the supergene, is it expressed in males? So you showed the expression in, in, in workers, but is it also expressed yes. in, in males? So we haven't looked, so, it, uh, so GP9 is ex expressed, uh, no, it's not, GP9 is not expressed in males, uh, and males are a bit different. So males of the two different haplotypes are different. They are a bit smaller, they have less sperm. This has been de uh, shown by Dwayne. Uh, small B males have less sperm. And they may have other differences. They could be also different small b haplotypes, as we don't know. But probably there's more type of selection. We have several evidence of other things, which I didn't mention from our group, and the way of other selection, meiotic drive, and things like that. So there are other processes which are linked to the haplotype, which also affect the frequency of the two haplotypes. They are less important than the selection against a, a big b, big, big queen. But there are other things which are linked to, to differences uh, between two haplotypes. So I, I ask that because if the genes are, are kind of f female specific, then, then they'll still accumulate a genetic load because if they're not being expressed in the yes. males, then, then that force yes. of, of purging is not going to. So what's lethal in females must be something which is specific to female. But uh, as you know, most genes, when you compare caste or sexes, most genes are so expressed. That there are very few genes which are only expressed in, in one sex or one caste. M most genes are more highly expressed in one, one type of individual than the other one. But there are very few genes which are only expressed in one, uh, one, one stage or caste. Great. It was a great discussion. And uh, we will have a... Uh